In this segment, we're going to talk about word embeddings. Word embeddings are one of the most important ideas in NLP in the last decade. And the reason is because they really are what allow us to bridge the gap from raw text to uh, representations that can work well for models like neural networks. Neural networks have been around for a very long time, and they're very good at learning functions over continuous data. But for a long time, it wasn't really clear how to take discrete, kind of very discrete data, like words and, and particularly like bag of words representations, and actually get them to work well in neural nets. And so uh, word embeddings are kind of the first step towards bridging that gap. And so they were one of the key pieces to enable the kind of neural revolution in NLP with things actually working a lot better. Okay, so to sort of set up the basic idea, we're going to start with a uh, Again, very simple sentence, sentiment uh, example sentence, um, where uh, we can map movie was good into a bag of words representation. And so, again, we're going to use unigrams here. And so, uh, you know, roughly we could think about that as some space like this, where you know, you've got a whole bunch of zeros and then three ones in this vector uh, that correspond to uh, the positions of the words which occur in the sentence. One way to think about this is that it is the sum of three vectors. Um, and I'm just going to write them like this uh, to mean that there's only a single one uh, in, in each of these. Um, Okay, so uh, again, we can decompose this into uh, three vectors, each of which has a single one in it summed together, and that gives our bag of words representation that has three ones in it. Okay, so this is a way of thinking about going from a word-level representation to a sentence-level representation. So why is bag of words a problem? So if we say film is great, uh, you know, we have some other set of ones and this is actually orthogonal to movie was good. So there is no apparent connection between these two sentences, because they don't overlap in any words. So the dot product between these is going to be zero. And generally, we kind of can't tell that these are related at all. And so that's, that's OK if we have a ton of training data, right? Like if we have uh, a whole bunch of data, we can theoretically see examples of both movie was good and film is great, and uh, you know, learn appropriate weights for all of these things. But to, in some sense, this, this sort of shows that our input representation doesn't reflect very much about the underlying structure of language. Because we're not taking advantage of the fact that, uh, for example, film and movie are you know, very closely related terms in this case. And so this is where the idea of word embeddings come in. So word embeddings are, we are going to say, low dimensional representations of words um, capturing their similarity. OK. When I say low dimensional, uh, you know, a typical range of values we're going to think of, at least for this part of the course, is between 50 and 300. 
So this may not seem all that low dimensional uh, until you think of the fact that, uh, you know, let's assume that our vocabulary size is 10,000 words. Um, and like, This, vec this 0, 1 vector up here was a 10,000 dimensional vector. So 300, much less than 10,000, and sort of low dimensional from that standpoint. And the rough kind of picture you should have, which again, we're going to draw a kind of two dimensional view of this, is that uh, these embeddings should group similar words near each other, right? So uh, unlike before, where every word was as, like, as far apart from every other word as it was from any other word, uh, because they're all mutually orthogonal in this 10,000-dimensional space, now you, know, you can expose the idea that movie and film are perhaps more similar to one another than either is to the words was or is. So this is a very powerful idea because it's going to start to let us have networks that generalize potentially to words that we haven't seen before. We train something on movie was good, and now suddenly film is great comes in as input. And even though we've never seen those particular words, the vectors are sufficiently close to things that we have seen before that the network's going to like output the same prediction. And in this case, that would be the right thing to do. So before we get into any specific algorithms, we're just going to talk about the rough idea of how we might go about learning these embeddings. Uh, so this is an idea that goes back to J.R. Firth uh, in 1957, and it's what's called the distributional hypothesis. Um, and it can be succinctly summarized as You shall know a word by the company it keeps. All right. What does that actually mean concretely here? So let's say we have access to a whole bunch of text on the web. How are we going to use that to learn what these different words mean? Here, we're going to look at a f examples of four sentences. All right, so... We have four examples here, two each containing movie and film. And so the basic idea behind the distributional hypothesis is that movie and film seem to be words that are substitutable or can occur in similar contexts. So for example, I watched the movie or I watched the film. Um, we're going to talk about syntactic parsing further down the road, but uh, movie and film here are both direct objects of watched. And so watched has what we call selectional preferences. It you know, has certain types of arguments that uh, you know, are things that you can watch, right? Uh, and in this case, we see that movie and film are both things that can be watched. Um, the film inspired me. The movie inspired me. Um, so there are also things that, in this case, are the subjects of the verb inspire. And so uh, even just looking at kind of surface word context around each of these words, we can get a sense that they might be similar because they get used in similar contexts. And so that's the kind of idea behind Firth's hypothesis. So it's worth ask, it, it's worth state, saying that like I, I'm presenting a very simplified view here. Um, 
you know, if you have another sentence like I developed the film in the dark room, um, this is going to be a context that's unique to film because we have a different sense of the word. We're talking about like the actual like film reel or whatever rather than, um, you know, the idea of, of, of a movie basically. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be complexity in terms of learning these things. But basically, in aggregate, we expect to see movie and film in more similar contexts than we expect to see movie and mango or something like that. So the, it's, it's also worth noting that there have been implementations of this idea going back a long time in NLP. So, um, you know, uh, there's kind of older algorithms like brown clustering, um, et cetera, that have uh, implemented this kind of idea for a long time. Um, so, but... Uh, The kind of version of this that really seemed to take off and stick uh, was a version called Word to Vec uh, by Tomas Mikolov et al. in 2013. And the idea is the following. Um, each word is going to be mapped to a uh, a word vector and a context vector. And we predict each word's context given that word. So the idea here is that uh, we are going to see a whole bunch of examples of words in context, and we are going to learn vectors where a word's vector should be predictive of the words that are going to occur in the con or in, you know, around places where that word is seen in the text. And so by doing this, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, exact you know, methods for doing so, which there's, there's a lot of them. Um, but essentially, we are going to learn we are going to kind of operationalize this idea of the distributional hypothesis and be able to learn vectors that capture this kind of similarity. That's it for this segment.